Massive thank you as always to our top tier patrons, Sarah Turner, Alexander Lashley and Avery. For as little as $3, you can gain access to patron-only episodes, as well as access to our Discord server, where we host weekly live discussions with host Ekoi Hero and myself. So if you like what you hear, come join us at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head. Please do rate us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on social media. We're on Reddit, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any questions or comments about this episode or the podcast in general, then email it's not just in your head at gmail.com. Today, substance abuse counsellor Ikoi Hero and myself are joined by anthropologist Professor Rebecca Cassidy, author of Vicious Games, Capitalism and Gambling. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. The landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. There were some sort of statistics in that book that were uh, eye-opening. I guess maybe they shouldn't be surprising, but it was it was stuff like um, Sweden. Uh, if you have a gambling issue, you're 15 times more likely to commit suicide. New Zealand had calculated that the total burden of harm is bigger than diabetes and arthritis. And there's this quote in the book: "A gambling reveals where power lies in society." I think what the book does very successfully is sort of unpacks this idea of um, that. I don't know if you have the same in the States, Equi, but there's a, there's a thing here, um, a term, a responsible gambling or gamble responsibly, something like that, isn't it? And it's sort of very much framing it that this is on you as an individual. If you have a problem with gambling, <laughs> it's your problem. And, um, and that's where the responsibility lies. And I think in your book, you can sort of unpack that in, in numerous kind of um, interesting different ways. But I think maybe before we even uh, sort of go in all those kind of directions, I thought it was really interesting, maybe the history of gambling or even not even calling it that, like, it, you know, the difference between maybe betting and gambling. I wondered if you could talk a bit maybe about that, um, how people conceptualize gambling or maybe how that sort of changed over time. Yeah, I think I think um, it, it, that question kind of goes to the heart of why I wrote the book, which was to sort of open up the question of what is gambling, so that we could perhaps better organise collectively to disrupt the idea that the gambling we have now is natural or normal. So one way of doing that is, is as I'm an anthropologist, is showing that gambling takes lots of different forms in particular times and places. And by looking at the meaning and the outcomes of those sorts of encounters or engagements with uncertainty and chance, and showing that there's nothing necessarily sort of exploitative about those outcomes, it shows really the, the sort of the version of commercial gambling that we currently tolerate is actually quite unique. And that sort of turns arguments by the industry that gambling is natural on their head, if you like, and instead says, you know, the, the version of commercial gambling that we that we have now is actually sort of the product of a very distinctive moment in history. In, in the book, I distinguish between betting and gambling um, and betting in the UK particularly, has always had this sort of very working class history where people make informed choices about the outcomes of particularly races between horses or dogs. And so part of my fieldwork was spent in betting shops where local people came to kind of make communities of certain kinds, if you like, um, while betting on a, a limited number of events during each afternoon. And when I spent time working in betting shops, I, I, I was able to sort of document the change, if you like, from that kind of quite considered, quite sort of embedded activity through to a kind of a different sort of activity, which was based on high frequency, kind of very limited time to reflect kind of activities like playing on machines. 
So in that sense, I think what I how I describe it is a movement from betting to gambling. And, and you know, a lot of bookmakers would see it in those terms as well. They would recognise what I'm describing. There used to be sort of 40 opportunities to bet in an afternoon in a, bet, in a bookies in the sort of 1980s. And when bookmakers realised they could produce their own content, then really, you know, it was sort of unlimited opportunities to bet. And then, of course, we had the introduction of fixed odds betting terminals, which were depicting roulette on machines, which allowed you to place a bet in inverted commas um, every sort of 15 seconds. So it's kind of changing what gambling is from a sort of considered activity that's part of your, you know, your your community perhaps um, to something that is fairly disembodied um, and to do with getting out of your head and into a zone, uh, as Natasha Shaw calls it, in relation to casino gambling in Las Vegas. Right, yeah, there was the um, uh, the example of the pachinko machines, right, in Tokyo, where you've had a hard day at work, so you then go zone out for, like, anything up to, what, six hours or something like that, which I think is sort of fascinating because it has a parallel with social media as well, right? Like, mm. that, that it's sort of a well-known thing that social media companies hired uh, sort of casino types to come help them figure out how to make their platform sort of addictive there is a, a sort of de-stressing potentially to to using social media i mean you know it's an angry place but <laughs> there is definitely that thing of like um you tune into these apps and then you zone out and the idea that actually you know the, the machines the gambling machines also sort of serve a similar function right they allow you to escape to some degree maybe from whatever situation you're in, at least for a short period of time. And I think it's really useful to make that comparison and uh, also to look at the economics of that. So, um, you know, simply betting 60 times in an afternoon, it, it has a, will produce a sort of maximum revenue of, of one at one level, but then providing unlimited opportunities to, to gamble shifts that potential and makes it much higher. So you, you have also the incentive of the um, operators providing opportunities to gamble um, to maximise the time that people spend on those machines because they're highly profitable in a way that betting on horses and dogs wasn't. It was really interesting, the bit in the book where you sort of said, you know, they have to make these machines uh, so that they're capable of receiving violence from the customers. And then because they get so frustrated with it. And then and then there's that thing that happens to you in the shop. Right. Mm, Which yeah. is there's a feeling of, you know, that violence doesn't just stay <laughs> at the machines. Right. There's a sort of us and them thing that happens that I thought was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I think most of the people who work in betting shops um, will recognise the stories I tell in that chapter and, you know, the pressures that they're under were particularly heightened by fixed odds betting terminals. And they went from being facilitators and hosts who had a lot in common with their customers um, when they were betting on dogs and horses to people who were exploiting them and people became angry and you can understand why. Yeah, it was really sometimes dangerous to work in a betting shop. I mean, I, I think I mentioned the Facebook page of um, people who, of ex-workers in betting shops. I think it was something like, I no longer fear hell because I've worked in a betting shop. Right, right. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's definitely not an exaggeration. There were some, there were more and less um, fraught places to work, but certainly where people were, already disadvantaged in certain ways and felt they were being exploited, uh, it was a, a really difficult atmosphere to, to conduct in which to conduct field work. Um, and yeah, it was uh, the, the, there were lots of cases of damaged machines and, and, and um, injury to people. Um, what wasn't as evident was the harm that people were experiencing from the machines, which I then had to shift my focus by talking to gamblers themselves. And then that also becomes evidence. Right. And the, there was one thing that was sort of particularly striking was the someone you knew who ultimately committed suicide. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
and that you know that was a sort of the example of what I uh, mentioned at the beginning was that the individualized element of it that they saw themselves as uniquely responsible for what well, I don't know if they called it their addiction, but it was that was ultimately they felt like they carried all the blame for the situation they were now in this sort of loop. Yeah, in 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 a lot of ways, um, you know, the the compulsive end of uh, the behaviors associated with gambling and substance use is very similar. They also intersect quite a lot. Mm. You're right, Liam and, and and Ikoi. The 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 pathways that people followed quite often involved a, a kind of introspection that was a product of the responsible gambling narrative. And the idea that there was a category of person who could be described as a an in quotes problem gambler. So what that did was to create a sort of category of normal people in inverted commas who could gamble safely, you know, without harming themselves, without experiencing any ill effects. And then there were people who were experiencing harm. And because of the way it was framed in policy and by corporations providing these products and by healthcare as well, people who were harmed by gambling were almost invited to say, what's wrong with me? And, you know, that's what they said to me, things like, well, it's it, I, I've got an addictive personality. Um, I've inherited it from my parents. Um, normal people can handle gambling. What's wrong with me? The government wouldn't allow it if it wasn't safe and so on. So one of the things I do in the book is to examine the narratives that are used to frame gambling by policymakers. And they almost always begin with the idea that gambling is harmless for the vast majority of people, but for a small minority, um, it, it's a problem. And that problem lies with them. Um, so th there were some quite explicit descriptions of this figure of the problem gambler and they were always presented as people who were vulnerable in some sort of generic way so if they weren't addicted to gambling they would be addicted to alcohol or drugs or something else and so what that does is it takes the problem away from the products and the policies and the processes that are used to promote the products and places it on the individual. And that was it, it's it's just a really clear example of that process um, that, that that's you know happening in all other lots of many other contexts as you document on this podcast. Yeah, well, I, I thought the thing that was really interesting was uh, also this idea of recategorizing it from what was sort of had a stigma almost <laughs> betting and and being involved in that world to then reclassifying it. And this is particular to the UK. I'm not quite sure how it works in the States. I've been to Las Vegas for one night. It was very fun. But <laughs> I think um, in the UK, it got reclassified as a sort of leisure activity. And that that then changed, uh, you know, when you describe something that way, then it has all these sort of connotations and all these uh, un maybe intended or unintended consequences. And I think one of the, the really interesting things, uh, there's a quote, you don't need to be a gambler to be ha harmed by gambling. And there's this uh, basically, for, what was the thing? For every person who has a problem, there's six others affected. So in categorizing everything as a leisure, this as a leisure pursuit, sort of um holds hands in a quite a nice way with sort of some of the neoliberal stuff which is about like your freedom uh as an individual right um that yeah. you that you are the one responsible we're going to tell you some risks and then you know it's up to you whether you want to partake in this thing and that that is enough of a warning um and that's really interesting because obviously that has lots of parallels with cigarette packet warnings or alcohol, but the harm happens <laughs> um, regardless of those warnings. So to what degree is it, you know, if you, uh, uh, one of the things that I thought whilst reading that is if I, someone who doesn't really gamble, like I said, went to Vegas 24 hours, that's about the extent I've done, right? It, or so I think, again, because gambling covers lots of different uh, things as we'll discuss, but it's like if I uh, have chosen say not to gamble 
I haven't chosen then for like one of my friends to suddenly be affected by it and then it affect me. So to what degree is it actually an individual freedom? Like when you actually scratch below the surface, if it affects me through someone else, hmm. then you then open up this problem with this sort of particular perspective, which is that ultimately we are all affected by each other. We do live in a thing called society and that you have to make considerations for that. So yeah. Exactly. I, the, the thing is, I think that's why I work on gambling. It's not. It's not just because I'm. I'm not really just working on gambling. I'm working against the idea that we are a collection of individuals, and for the idea that we are a society. I, you know, I, I just believe passionately that we should be finding collective solutions to our problems, and I think that viewing ourselves as individuals in the way that you've described is the source of lots of our problems. Um, so that I use gambling as a lens to get at that. Um, and it just happens to illustrate it really clearly. Yeah. And also, you know, you there's a, there's a bit in the book, Australia, low to moderate gamblers cause the most harm, not the extreme ends, right? So that, again, completely upends the thing that we're told. And this, you know, previously I've worked in uh, video games, mobile video games, and it very quickly... Um, bleeded into that gambling aesthetic or sort of way of designing things that everything should be this sort of uh, random fixed odds kind of thing you're trying to encourage people to spend money it all just got a bit like Ugh, if this feels exploitative right but the thing I remember coming across back then was this idea that it's the you you make the most amount of money through these in-app purchases or whatever but the the people spending the money was actually a small percentage of people, the people with the problem. Um, and to what degree that's true, I don't know. It's just something that, that somebody said. But it's kind of interesting, this idea that actually that that might be a lie, that it's not this tiny group of people with the problem, because that would be very convenient for uh, the gambling industry or for, uh, you know, video gaming industry that sort of monetizes its games that way, that actually it is a much broader issue and there's parallels obviously there with again with um with tobacco and and with alcohol i mean ikoi have you sort of got any thoughts in passing cuz i'm just sort of rabbiting on here i think there is the harms that come from you know this activity and how it impacts different countries um japan is is a very high gambling culture it's it's very old probably one of my earliest uh memories is watching historical action like in in japan like there is this genre of tv where it's a bunch of like you know samurais and ronins and their their act you know the saving the day whatever and those you know, often feature like the the classic bakto scenes uh which is the you know the dice throwing um that the yakuza still plays to this day and it's uh very associated with the um black market activities of, of various kinds but um yeah, Mahjong is, is another big one. So, yeah, it's one of those things where it's, you know, to a certain degree, I guess, you know, having, and obviously Pachinko, um, I've, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because it, it is something that I've kind of viewed as not necessarily natural, right? But, but kind of, I guess, somewhat of like a, a common trajectory of large scale society seems to be like gambling <laughs> but but i think that the, the maybe the difference is that uh, randomness and risk have been things that always existed right and this is certainly just sort of paraphrasing stuff from from your book in to, to some degree that they've always existed it's the cultivation and the shouldering of where that risk goes right is the thing that is maybe sort of been um orchestrated or manipulated in some way right like that right. there is a bit of a coincidence that there's an alignment of political sort of socio-economic forces that go hand in hand with what happened you know when betting really turned into gambling and you can play random games you can sort of 
have fun with risk. And I think that's a that I mean, you opened the book with it. And maybe we should have spoken about it straight out the gate, because it is a fascinating example, what you talked about with raffles as being like, as the fun version, really, and the the social version of playing with risk and randomness. I, I wondered if you mm. wanted to talk about that a bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, your eco is actually these games and encounters with risk and playing with risk, as you said, Liam, they they t- take different forms in different societies. And I think what I'm pointing out is that, as you say, in the in the kind of the form that commercial gambling is taking currently, and it's a you know it's just hitting Japan uh, in in the form of online gambling, um, and they've also just legislated, as you'll know, for um, for casinos. Um, in the form it takes currently, in the form that will be kind of exported to Japan in both those media, both in casinos, in bricks and mortar casinos and online, the interests, as Liam says, are going to be totally aligned with those of capital. You know, and, oh, yeah. and, and I think the, you know, that's why it's interesting to me to look at something like raffles, which are, you know, part of, I don't know if we can exaggerate it for Ecoy's benefit, but, you know, raffles are just part of British life, um, yeah. you know, for at schools, um, within clubs and so on. And their purpose in those contexts is primarily redistributive. And so the reason I wanted to show that kind of way in which chance can operate is that it can be liberating and it can reduce inequality and it can be part of a sort of anarchic approach to um, uh, producing parity and equality um, because you're basing the outcome of something on chance. Um, And so you can kind of operate out outside some of the prejudices that exist in society and you can kind of short circuit the existing um, sort of tendencies to distribute wealth uh, according to existing patterns uh, and therefore sort of increase hierarchies and differentials you know so it's you know so when you the the raffle I describe in the book is in a, a club for seniors where we would take something that we thought other people would enjoy and put it on uh, a trolley and we would take things like cabbages from allotments or you know a few tins of salmon or some chocolate or whatever it might be and we would put it on the trolley and then we would admire the things on the trolley and say how wonderful they were and then we would be each of us would be given a ticket with a number on it and we would get to pick something from the trolley in the order that we our numbers were picked out and you see that you know that to me is kind of there's something that something bonding and community driven and building about that and you know and Mm -hmm. I wanted to say about gambling it isn't necessarily um exploitative or um or, or a terrible thing far from it in lots of forms it actually um you know creates really strong bonds for people and is very sort of socially rewarding um but what i what i am kind of cautious about is um is is kind of treating commercial gambling in that way because commercial gambling is you know does take place outside any sort of society and reinforces precarity and inequality um, and is presented as this kind of social activity. So British um, bookmakers are fond of saying, oh, everyone in Britain loves a flutter. You know, well, there's a big difference between betting on, we have one race a year called the Grand National that everyone... Right, right, yeah. Bet on. There's a big difference between doing that and sitting on your own with your mobile phone out and spending like £12,000 in two days on a, on a casino. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this is, uh, 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 well, there's so many different ways it could go here, but I just sort of reiterate some of that stuff, which is just that, like you say, like essentially capital comes along and co op something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> surprise, surprise, I guess. But <laughs> it's like there's the, the beautiful part about that that whole social experience of spending money to get a raffle ticket and then, you know, seeing who the winner is. Like it's all good. It's just fun. But there's this great quote where someone says, like, uh, you know, they I've, I think they have like a whole bunch of stuff in their garage um, that they've collected over the years. And he says, you see badminton sets and bad art. I see 20 years of giving and taking. 
Mm. And yeah. uh, I thought that sort of really tied into, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was in one of David Graeber's books where he talks about that this idea like uh, pre-money economies would just yeah. exchange gifts all the time to keep their social relations um, positive, right? And you never yeah. wanted to cancel out all your gifts because then the friendship is is over. And I think this... I thought it was just a yeah a really uh, positive and kind of hopeful example of how you can play with randomness and uh, enjoy that uh, and also sort of benefit your community and and I, I also found it interesting how the, everyone in the group would make sure like if they won like two or three weeks in a row that they would redistribute the prize to other yeah. people as well and no one wanted to because you're being seen. Uh, no one wanted to be like above or or below anyone. Everyone wanted to create uh, some sort of equality. The the thing I wanted to jump into was something that you just said. Yes, right. Okay. So the people working in the industry, there's this bit in your book where you're talking about someone who fosters the relationship with the VIP things, right? That idea of someone spending a, a considerable amount of money very quickly. Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to maybe talk about that a bit, like sure. you know how people f think about themselves that the, when they work in the industry, like the mental gymnastics they have to do, or mm. um, in particular that lady who worked with the VIP thing. I thought was like, yeah, yikes. Mm. Yeah, I did too. Well, there's also I, I really like the point you made about David's uh, work, and you know we all do really miss him, and I was lucky enough to be his colleague at Goldsmith. So, you know, I, I, I really, um, you know, I thank you for that connection there. And I think just before I go on to the, the uh, worker in Gibraltar, um, you know, I think that for me, that kind of raises the question, which I think, um, you know, again, is implicit in many of your, these podcasts is, you know, well, what is human nature? And whose view of human nature are you going to work with or or think about? And, you know, you have David's view of people as, you know, um, instinctively helpful and generous and kind, actually, you know, and, and wanting to be bonded to each other um, in relations of exchange and so on. And then you have the kind of neoliberal view, which is um you know that people are basically greedy and out for themselves and you know i see gambling policy as a product of the latter and i see the examples i've brought together uh, from from whether it's raffles or um um you know amongst african societies studied in the 60s by woodburn or whoever you know there's a, a different kind of way of thinking about what is a you know, what is personhood and how do people relate to one another? And I think that that's going to be, for me, that's a more productive and interesting way to think about what is society and 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 who are we than this idea that we're all trying to kind of, I almost swore, but um, oh, you can, you through can, each other. <laughs> you can absolutely swear it's fine. Like there was a, there was a quote in the book where some guy had leaned to you and just said you do realize we're all cunts right like one of the guys who worked in the industry i was like and it was you know the book is full of that like all these people just going yeah i'm a piece of shit and i'm sort of aware of it but i'm sort of stuck yeah. in my job it was kind yeah. of mind-blowing yeah and i remember that guy who had like that he, he said to me he was losing his hair from working in the industry you know it was he was literally falling apart Wow. Um, yeah. I. So, yeah. How do you work in the industry? Well, I sort of started from a position of, well, you know, the idea that you have to be a bastard to work in the industry, that sort of puts them outside any kind of critical attention. If I do, you know, that can't be a helpful sort of starting point. So, you know, I was I was conscious that gambling harms people and I was aware of that you know, the consequence of, of, of that harm. Um, so I kind of then started to look, well, what stories do people in the industry tell themselves to make their lives livable, if you like? Because if I can understand that, then I can start to change that narrative and I can start to kind of explain it to other people so that they can be, you know, starting to collectivize and starting to respond to that narrative and produce their alternatives. Um, which I think, you know, an organisation like Gambling With Lives have, have done very successfully. Um, and, 
when I then started to think, well, how do I find out about it? I, you know, I turned to participant observation because that's my primary method as an anthropologist. And what I wanted to know was, well, how how do you, what's your everyday life like if you work in in the gambling industry? And uh, kind of did that in a number of different spaces. One one was betting shops in London, which we've spoken about. Um, and um, the other was Gibraltar, where the online industry is headquartered um, for tax purposes and regulatory purposes. So it's a sort of offshore industry um, with all of the sort of ethical and moral um, uh, questions that that raises. So already you're sort of part of a quite a sort of liminal society in some ways. You know, you're outside some of the kind of rules and regulations that might govern citizenship in other places somehow. It, you know, Gibraltar does feel like this, you know, it is physically a rock, as you, everyone knows, and it does feel slightly detached from, from the mainland, uh, you know, physically, morally, ethically, um, you know, intellectually. It's, it's, a, it's a strange feeling, you know, they, they, they built their wealth on, on pirating and you know stuff like that and it, it still feels like that kind of slightly unhinged place um so so when i started just sort of observing people at work and and uh uh at the online industry I, I kind of tried to make myself think well how would i make this make sense and really what happened was i i saw that they thought they were doing a good job um on the basis that you know they had absorbed the idea that if they provided uh, a space where they encourage, in inverted commas, responsible gambling, then really that was them discharging their duty. And anyone who was then still harmed by gambling, I'm afraid that was their responsibility. Um, and although to me that seemed uh, um, an un unconvincing story, it was a story that made sense to a lot of the people there. Um, and it was the way that they explained their actions and it was how they made sense of their participation in an industry that harmed people. Um, so yeah, I, I was determined to kind of provide a, a, an alternative to the idea that everyone who works for bookies is kind of a sociopath or, um, or evil, you know, which is the other kind of way of explaining it. And, that is impossible to oppose. One of the things that struck me with the lady who who's fostering these relationships with the the VIP uh, clients and VIP essentially being <laughs> the people that spend lots of money is interesting, isn't it? Because like there's this bit where it's talking about the business model is essentially making sure that the losers stay on uh, lifetime value uh, was the phrase, right? Which is interesting because that exists in the video game world as well. That idea that anyone who's a winner um you just sort of want to quietly discourage or sort of block um i don't know if that was the case still now because you mentioned like different companies coming along and sort of trying to play with that but the idea of fostering relationships over the phone the the dark bit i think was when she said like oh if i was with them in real life like i wouldn't want to see that or i would i would stop them yeah um, yeah and i think i think things are possible aren't they when you're not face to face with people that would not be possible if you were you know if you could imagine being part of their life but i think that the online stuff is definitely has definitely increased um you know the ability of people to dissociate from their customers in inverted commas and to downplay whatever they might have in common with them and to see them as statistics and account numbers. So when I was in the betting shop, um, you know, people were, you know, flesh and blood. And you, there were examples of managers who would go to people's funerals, um, go and check on people if they didn't turn up in the shop. Uh, you know, there were real, there were relationships of care, I would say, um, in betting shops. And then, but online, um, you know, you're simply a, a, a set of checks and balances and then profit and loss. Um, and I think it does make possible a kind of depersonalization, 
that wasn't necessarily as um, easily achieved in betting shops in person. Right, yeah, it reminded me quite a bit of uh, drone pilots mm. Mm -hmm. that you can do harm remotely and sort of have that distance so that it doesn't uh, fully get you, although obviously it, it really does damage people. It sort of does catch up. I just, you know, I wonder where that, that the lady is now who, who does the who did the VIP phone calls and stuff because it sounded like she was pretty close to all these people. Mm. Um but then, yeah, it sounds to me like when lots of people leave the industry from your accounts, that's when they sort of uh, really have that moment uh, where they right. look in the mirror and they're a bit more like, oh, God, I was I was part of something that was causing harm. Um, yeah. Now, California is interesting, you know, case in, in terms of gambling because it's the native tribes that are given the right to – to casinos in the state yeah and it, it's really interesting because so like uh maybe a, a year or so ago uh we had dr um Ansluis on who is first nations in, in canada and that was one of the questions mm -hmm. i asked him because that becomes part of the that's part of the thing towards some kind of um independence in some ways right that the right. money that they generated from the casinos becomes part of like <laughs> getting back, I guess. <laughs> at the uh, right, the I mean, it's also yeah, and it's you know, ultimately, ultimately, like a lot of tribal lands in California are usually somewhat rural. Um, they're not close to cities. They're they're not necessarily like high industry you know areas at all where there's plenty of jobs um so in on one hand like you know the casinos have brought in a lot of work to um the reservations i mean i know quite a few you know various tribe members that are very proud of their casinos you know it, it, and it is kind of like that thing of of yeah, independence. There's a really good ethnography of um, it's called tribal gaming. Um, You're right. In uh, in Florida by Jessica Catalino. So she's she's really she's a really good anthropologist, and uh, she writes about how you know the the white settler community are very tolerant of um, indigenous gaming as long as they keep it kind of informal and aren't too profitable um, and behave in ways that kind of fulfill stereotypes of Native American. It's a really interesting book. Hmm. I highly recommend it. It's called well, it, strikes, it strikes me as well that it sort of fits into that cultural thing that's been, been uh, for want of a better word, cultivated as well. It's like there's the, the idea that risk is also a uniquely sort of American value or, or almost virtue that I think that sort of leads in kind of nicely to this idea that the gambling uh, industry, which is worth, you know, uh, 2015, you've got Morgan Stanley saying it's worth $423 billion, right? Um, right. Yeah, this, I think like... Go on. Oh, no, like in California, you know, the um, tribal casinos are about a $20 billion business. Right, right, right. I don't know if was that a global figure for the Morgan Stanley thing, or, or whether that was. I, I'm not quite sure, but 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 it's that idea that the 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 whole culture around it has been cultivated and created, opposed to it being sort of something that would just naturally uh, occur, regardless of. <laughs> um, uh, it's just human behavior, right? And that, that again, that comes back to one of sort of Graeber's things of like, there isn't just sort of government on one side and markets on the other. It's that government helps foster markets and that, that the way that you've sort of outlined it in the book is very clear how that exactly happened in, in Britain, um, but, you know, beginning with the national lottery and then everything, everything after that. So again, it's, it's, you're finding yourself existing in an environment that is sort of encouraging you and pushing you saying like, Hey, gambling is this sort of fun thing. Don't worry about it, which is a, you know, sort of an antisocial message really to begin with, but it's cloaked in other language. Yeah. Is, it, uh, it's your freedom to consume it. it yeah. We, it, I suppose the, 
the book was supposed to point out that, you know, this was not a, a, a progression caused by technology or not a something that happened out of the blue. It was a, you know, it was a deliberate decision to cultivate gambling and to make the UK the hub of online gambling in particular and to cultivate this industry. And it's really common in Australia and the UK and the United States to say that risk is part of our culture, you know, defining part of our culture. Um, and the gambling industry loves that. And they uh, really, really enjoy hearing those, those thoughts. Um, and, and they sort of then present themselves as saying, well, we're just giving you an opportunity to indulge those perfectly natural um, kind of impulses. But, but the point is that they are, uh, they are t- sending you down a particular pathway and coming to actually define how you should satisfy those, those desires and encouraging you to use products that are the quickest way to, the quickest and most sustainable way, if you like, for them to prosper while you are um, more impoverished. So it, it's it's kind of, they're, they, they're using the idea that you're a natural risk taker and then channeling um, and, and, and kind of encouraging you to think of yourself in that way and then channeling through you, this, through you into this very sort of extractive business. Um, and at the same time, kind of describing it as something natural. Well, as you said, Liam, you know, in video games, and there is this huge crossover with gambling, those products have been engineered in order to extract wealth from you um, consistently. And and so it's 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 kind of um, it, it's kind of misleading in, in my view to kind of think of uh, the idea of a of a risk taking society. Uh, that isn't cultivated by people who want you to take risks <laughs> and who will yeah. find it lucrative if you do so. Yeah, and it's, it falls under that category of um, freedom to, but not freedom from, right? Like you're free to um, gamble your money away and then, you know, uh, it become a chronic problem and then commit suicide, but you're not free from, well, you're not free from uh, the potentials of suicide. You're not free from... Uh, you know, destitution, right? So it's like, yeah, how, yeah that doesn't and, work, right? And, and you're not free to kind of decide, I don't want gambling to be part of my life or part of my children's life because it's advertised alongside, you know, Premier League football or whatever it is. You can't choose a mm-hmm. life outside gambling. You can't choose for your children not to be exposed to it. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's it's a very distinctive version of freedom and it's again that sort of narrative that is very difficult to oppose until you get kind of what I think anthropology does quite well which is to sort of open up black boxes of particular industries and say well how does this work in practice and you know where can I get some leverage (laughs) yeah and you know the harm reduction angle on all of it It, you know there's a great quote in that book parking it parking an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff rather than building a fence at the top that's the sort of uh current stance right like it's not about sort of preventing harm it's just sort of letting it happen and then having these sort of few little um i don't know you pay a fine just to do business right for when you get caught yeah and and you you know you discharge your responsibilities by paying for treatment services Mm. What, well you know, isn't it better not to have people who can't afford to buy shoes for their kids to go to school um, than to provide them with sort of free therapy? Um, so it, it's just an approach and it's absolutely um, unquestioned in uh, gambling regulation. That- right. And, and that was really interesting as well as like, you know, surprise, surprise, they regulate themselves to some degree in terms of their research, right? Like in in that you putting this book together over, um, you know, quite a, a long period of time, early days, you sort of discovered some of that stuff, I guess. Yeah, so I, I, I came to, um, I, I, I was actually working on horse racing as my, was my first field work as a PhD student. And I 
then saw some funding advertised with the Research Council, the Economic and Social Research Council, as it was then, and um, an organisation. I think it was. I think it was called the Responsible Gambling Trust or Responsibility in Gambling Trust at the time. And I thought, okay, should I apply for this? It was my. You know, I was at, at my first post. I was only sort of in my twenties. My head of department saw it as well and said, "Oh, you must apply for this. This would be good for the department." Had no idea who who the Responsibility in Gambling Trust was. So I applied for it and got it to work in betting shops. And, um, you know, after a couple of years, I went to present my findings. And uh, it was a room full of people who were senior executives in bookmakers. And one of them just said to me um, when I'd spoken about um, what I'd seen in betting shops, well, how, 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 is, how do you think this is going to be useful research for us? After all, we've paid for it. Um, and the responsibility in gambling trust is funded by it's now gamble aware um, and is funded by voluntary contributions from the industry and at that time certainly they felt that um you know this was 20 years ago they felt that they the research should support their interests um in no uncertain terms and as i left the guy who the chief executive um ran off to me and said you know you can't say anything about your research unless you've cleared it with me first in writing and uh you know as a young researcher i kind of suddenly realized oh this this money um comes with expectations um and i'm really uncomfortable about that and it changed me changed my research and changed my approach completely of course and i started to think about you know, how is knowledge about gambling produced? And because, of course, how it's produced and it is going to frame the sorts of questions that are asked, the sorts of research design that are used and the sort of findings that are shared. And that will then inform policy. Um, and once I started to focus more on that, I saw that there were, you know, huge conflicts of interest in in gambling research. Um, and yeah, that was one of the one of the other reports I wrote with my colleagues, Claire and Andrea, um, called Fair Game, um, about the politics of gambling research. There's this key point that you make uh, in Victoria, Australia, and only 15% of the total harm caused by gambling was attributed to problem gamblers. The vast majority of harm occurs among low and moderate risk gamblers, a pattern consistent with those seen uh, with alcohol use. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, the, it sort of dis dismisses and dis uh, smashes the myth that it's just a small group of people who have a problem and that it really sort of, uh, bleeds out in a, in a massive way. We're, we're all, it's, it's all of our, not problem necessary, but it's all of, it's the decision for all of us. You know, I, I think we, we need to have independent research so that we can make informed decisions about what sort of commercial gambling industry we want. Um, and, and that's the absolute minimum, surely. Um, and, you know, we went from having uh, laws which prevented people from stimulating demand for gambling. You know, this was, this was the situation before the Gambling Act. Um, you know, the gambling products would be available to meet existing demand. But once that principle was removed, you then um, create an environment where people can market and use advertising um, uh, that, that is fairly kind of evident in, you know, Liam and I will have experienced it constantly if we watch live sport um, or if we, you know, if we use search engines and social media. Um, you know, it's a constant exposure to it. Um, and, you know, some theory, some some analysts have described it as a normalisation of gambling. Well, if that's going to be sort of experienced by the current generation who are have used social media as children, for example, and have grown up with um, Premier League football as, as that sort of come become so popular, we're not going to even know the impacts of 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 those social processes until 
the people who are who we're responsible for, I would argue, our children and young people um, are, are experiencing the harm um, that has been caused by those processes while they've been children. So, you know, we have all of these kinds of strange um, uh, rhythms and time frames, and we have absolutely no, no way of making informed decisions about what are the correct policies and what actions should we be taking. Um, we have instead, um, you know, the Gambling Commission is, um, is, is required to permit game, uh, gambling unless people can prove that it um, violates one of three principles of, you know, being um, non-transparent or being a source of crime or being harmful to vulnerable people or undefined. So, you know, the onus is on um, people to prove that gambling is harmful. Um, and the assumption is that it not, and therefore it should go ahead. And by framing gambling in that way, you just you make it almost impossible for research to kind of provide um, criticism of, of existing policy. And then by further making uh, research dependent on the, the, the very funding streams that they're supposed to be critiquing, um, you, you, you know, you cr create a huge conflict. It's uh, that whole idea of turning, I think there's a bit in the book about turning like football, essentially you turn the game, the betting version of it or the gambling version of it is that you turn football into a slot machine game, right? And that actually is just, again, social media is a slot machine to some degree. It's that gamification of everything. And what that does to your brain over a long period of time, I guess, is something to be sort of found out. But I think this is, again, one of those, what was sort of fascinating as well was the difference, the stark difference between men and women's attitudes towards gambling or what they considered to be gambling or not. And that the online thing, the smartphone thing was the way of getting like women to participate uh, in this space without them really feeling like it's, they're doing the same thing as like go into, I don't know, some musty betting shop where it's just a, a male space. Um, could you, yeah, maybe could, maybe could you talk about maybe some of um, sure how they sure. did that or you know what it is that the women are playing or yeah, sure. I mean, I think it was you know smartphones have totally transformed um, the accessibility of gambling, obviously, and you know as as they have many things, but. Certainly in the UK, before that, betting shops that you say were stinky, disgusting, masculine spaces, at least until the smoking ban, which really changed that a bit. But, you know, there were still places where I, when I walked in as a sort of, um, a, a, as a sort of middle class, middle aged woman, it would be like, you are in the wrong place kind of thing. So that sort of acted as a barrier to participation, if you like. Um, and, you know, conventionally women would go to the bingo instead. Um, but bingo halls started closing down, as you again, as you'll know, until they were sort of repopulated by machines. But what the what the sort of casino in your pocket does, your smartphone, is just makes gambling a private matter. Um, and companies quickly realised this and started branding gambling specifically for women. You know, the sort of pink kitten. Um, idea as, as it was initially in its most sort of basic form, then it became kind of uh, glittery celebrity tie-ins and stuff. So yeah, there was a definite feminization of the online product using smartphones. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, high definitely. Did you get advertised oh, it? Maybe? Sorry, no. Oh no, I was just I was just saying definitely like I've seen some of those adverts of you know gambling games where the visuals are very geared towards women you know of, of like kittens and rainbows and, and, <laughs> and like what well, was one you know unicorn one was Who like doesn't love that right yeah yeah like, what woman doesn't love unicorns and rainbows really that's it. Well, it's it's funny actually because we got um we got approached to do a bunch of artwork and animation for one of the gambling things, and uh, for any freelancers out there like uh, who haven't already learned this trick, you, you never say no. You just charge a ridiculous amount of money so that they go away, um, and it worked. But then they came back a week later and said, "Okay, we will do it for that sum of money." 
Wow. Yeah. And then it was just like, oh, God, you know, and it reminded me of that quote, a principal isn't a principal until it costs you money. And luckily, you know, I was in a sort of financial situation where I could say no. But mm-hmm. um, it wasn't easy. But I was just, you know, uh, and again, this is really interesting because and I, th- this is something you address in the book. There's a danger in, I don't know, just talking about this and given maybe my class position or whatever, I'm, it sounds like it's talking down at people who gamble and that, that actually the majority of people are working class that gamble. But the, that exact idea, as you detail in your book, is, is sort of used by the gambling lot of like, oh, it's a nanny state, you know, you shouldn't be told um, what you can and can't do and all that sort of stuff. But it's like there's a massive sort of class component to, to all of this. There would be an angle on this that just says, oh, you know, I'm working class, I'll do what I want right? Like, why should I listen to anyone? But that exact idea is also utilized by the industry as like, we're on your, we're on your side and we're helping you have a good time. Yeah. The, the adverts are a really good example of that. They totally exploit kind of lad banter sort of, oi, it's all just a good laugh. Ah, uh, it's, it's, um, a, a really kind of patch. I think, <clears throat> approach that I really don't appreciate. In 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 some ways, I think um, the, the the most eloquent critiques of the gambling industry have been from um, uh, former members of the industry who've worked their way up from manager and in betting shops to quite responsible positions and who've seen um, that kind of working class um, uh, positioning being exploited by advertising and marketing executives and it really pisses them off as well yeah yeah it's it's everywhere i mean how does it work in the states is it the same equally uh, actually isn't this a lot of the um casinos now like i don't know if you kind of saw that in vegas but are kind of like l- semi-luxury destinations. They have a lot of spa accommodations and shopping and, you know, shows. Um, so there's definitely, you know, like a lot of the live music and live entertainment venues are at casinos or casino funded. Um, but yeah, like a lot of the advertisement that I've seen for casinos is just like less focus on the gambling and a lot more focus on the peripheral, like, you know, come catch a show and come come shop at our outlet that's right next door. And those kinds of less focus on the gambling, more on the other, I guess, lead-ins. The buffet is like a huge all you can eat, you know, buffet is like a huge lead in for, you know, the industry. Like, um, I don't know if, if this is the case in the UK, but in the United States, a lot of the casinos have this all you can eat buffet that's very, very popular. Right. And it actually loses money because it's one where like the cost of the, uh, you know, the average person is actually um, they're paying less than what they would have paid at like a restaurant for a similar meal by a fairly large margin. So right. it's actually a money loser for the casino. But, you know, they keep do- doing it because it's effective. It brings people in. And once people are there, they're like, well, you know, might as well play a few games. Might as well. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The, in the United States, I mean, a lot of the casino advertisement is a lot. I mean, I, I'm not familiar with the UK advertisement, so I can't really speak on that. But, you know, the United States, the casino um, advertisements are a lot more kind of family friendly. Like if you weren't really paying attention, you would think that it's just like another resort advertisement. The last casino advertisement that I that I remember um and I can't remember why I remember this one but it was one of those things I was just like yeah for a casino I think there was maybe like a second of the scene of anyone you know gambling Mm. like the entire thing was like look at our food look at our beautiful room let's catch some live shows let's do some shopping you know we have this wonderful spa. You know, I think the ladies. I, I assume yeah. that it had to change because of the online stuff, because of the gambling in your pocket stuff. 
that suddenly you have to emphasize the in real life uh, experience part of it. That's also why the the smartphone stuff is so creepy. And, uh, you know, again, this making games that appeal to women and then not even thinking of it as sort of gambling, but just like it's a game. It's like it's all part of this cultural uh creation to sort of normalize a whole bunch of things that aren't again you know it's not necessarily for your health <laughs> it's not for your benefit it appears to be because it seems like it's going to be fun right but uh clearly yeah you know a lot of harm happens with all these things but it's tricky right because again uh there's some people who can have a drink and it's not a problem but the thing is what what you need to What's lost in that um, sort of narrative is um, how do we as a society feel about companies producing products that are known to be harmful and promoting those products as fun? Mm. That That's a kind of different question. And it's, you know, I, I, I don't feel pleased or happy about that. I, I think we should have a right to understand how those machines work um, I, I think we should know what, where their profits come from, and I think we should be able to decide whether or not we want them in our community. One thing that I think our listeners would really appreciate is if there is a little bit more detail elucidation as to the harms of gambling in, like the you know the low to moderate users. Hmm. Okay, so that would be things like um, having to make decisions about spending, um, deciding between um, perhaps healthcare expenses and um, your gambling, or perhaps not getting sufficient exercise or being time poor for your children. Um, I suppose there's also the opportunity cost of time you spent gambling and the other things you might be doing in terms of, I don't know, volunteering or contributing to society. I think there's absolutely no limit on what you might um, try to measure as, a, as an opportunity cost of gambling. Um, but it certainly isn't confined to uh, the symptom, symptoms of, um, you know, what would normally be defined or described as a gambling addiction. Um, it's the trade-offs that you make in order to continue gambling. A massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Alex Placito, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Jennifer Cox, Justin Harper, Rebecca Johns, Seamus O'Connell, and Sheena Bilmus. If you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just In Your Head. And you can hear more from Harriet on her radio show called Interpersonal Update. It's on WBAI at 2.30 EST on Wednesday afternoons and in the WBAI archives.